My name is Tim Creamer. I'm the Executive Director of the New York State School Boards Association. Welcome to the Newsmakers segment of Nisbet News, something that we try to do periodically where we sit down with people who are school officials, political officials, people who you read about, know about, want to know about uh, here in New York. So today we are very fortunate to have with us the relatively new Commissioner of Education here in New York, Mary Ellen Ilya. Welcome. We're glad you're back in New York. Thank you. And uh, this is uh, an interesting time, to say the least, for you to come back home. Uh, you know, uh, as well as anybody, uh, you probably had this kind of baptism by fire that this is a time when education reform is just bubbling every single day and the position you hold is front and center. Well, I've had the opportunity to be across the state in many different communities. Um, I started, my first uh, real visit was at Sweet Home where I started my career. And when I went in, the first group that I met with was the school board members. Yeah. And they were all there to talk with me. Um, and then I met with parents and met with teachers. And that's really been the pattern that I've had over the last um, six, seven weeks to get out and to talk to people and to listen to some of the issues and and to let them know that um, we're going to look at things that we need to review and see if there's any way we can improve. I'm a strong believer in the concept of continuous improvement. You know, you are where you are and you need to work to get better every day. Well, what I love about uh, what you're doing right now is you are everywhere. Uh, those of us who know how big this state is and how complex these issues are and how much it takes just to logistically move around. Right. I've been reading your itinerary every day thinking, how the heck is she, does she ever sleep? <laughs> well, luckily I don't need a lot of sleep, so that's a good <laughs> thing, right? Um, but I've had, I've had some great opportunities to meet with people across the state and to really hear from all of them um, their concerns and the things that we think that we need to, to do better. Yeah. For the last few <clears throat> years, of course, we've been focusing tremendous work and attention and resources onto higher learning standards, common core learning standards. Associated with that are standardized testing. Uh, we also were first in, kind of first to introduce those tests, link them to teacher and principal performance. And it has been a very controversial time, a bumpy road, certainly for your predecessor. And you've come into a time when all of this is in place, and in fact, reactions to that, receivership programs, opting out and things like that. Let's talk a little bit about that. Tell me a little about your experience with Common Core and standardized testing. Well, I'm, I am um, totally supportive of raising standards for students across this country, but clearly my, my focus is on New York. And, um, and I really believe that we need to make sure that we are preparing our students for what they're going to face when they walk out of high school. The world is very different now than it was even 10 years ago. And our kids have to be ready um, to be competitive for great positions in our, and, and we need to support the workforce that will help them to be su successful. So I'm, I'm really very much focused on making sure that um, we review the standards. Uh, um, I, as you're aware, the legislature passed a bill last year that would have, have the state review the Common Core standards. We're going to do that. Um, we're using a model that's been used in other places and to get feedback from people across the state. And I have a good friends of mine who are teachers who said to me, we need to look at some of the sequencing, for instance, in the higher level math course uh, courses and those particular standards. And we need to look at the developmentally appropriateness of some of the early standards for our kindergartens and first and second graders. I think that all that should be done by practitioners, yeah. by the people who are out in the field who every day are implementing standards in their classroom, and they're seeing the challenges of it, and they're seeing the reaction from their students. Generally, when I'm with teachers, though, they are not upset about the standards. They want more support to be able to implement the standards. Well, I hope that this review process does, in fact, strengthen what we've got, but protect it as well, because uh, as a parent, uh, I have three sons, they're all grown now, but I looked at those standards, I read them carefully. Now, I'm not a professional educator who could talk about sequencing and scaffolding, and I'm not a psychometrician regarding the tests, but I looked at what those standards, are, as they're stated, and I thought, these are reasonable expectations to have for kids. I could see where some of them might be a little of a push, mm -hmm. 
and maybe the testing is not truly in alignment with some of those standards, but the standards themselves, I would say, look pretty good. I think it's where the testing alignment and to what extent the kids have been exposed to the curriculum in support of those standards, that's where maybe things start to fall apart. I think uh, really the important thing is to establish the best standards we can, to have a review cycle put in place so that we know every five to six years we're going to look at them and see are they still as important and relevant as we think they might be now. And then um, I think that we need to make sure that our teachers have the supports that they need to be able to implement those standards. Well, and it's good. a critical, critical feature for um, the growth that we need in our classrooms across the state. You know, I think we all want the same thing as how we get there. And uh, we have some very different opinions as to how that's happened. We represent, of course, school board members and what is oftentimes referred to as local control. Now, local control, I've been doing this a long time, was always kind of defined as those who were elected officials or professional educators at the district level making decisions. Now with this opt-out movement, it almost looks like a lot of those decisions are moving from, I'll say, the boardroom to the kitchen table. That's a whole new paradigm shift for us. What do you think about that? Well, um, New York's been the center of, of standard testing with the Regents exams for decades. So yes, we have new, new assessments and they have to be the best they can be. Um, I don't think there's any question that we need to continually improve. And right now, uh, as you're well aware, we have uh, changed the vendor that is going to be developing our assessments. There are features in the new contract that will allow us to have input from many more practitioners, teachers, and l administrators, school board members, people from that can New be, York. That's it, yeah. from New York, yeah. who can be part of those teams to review items and to review exactly what's being developed. There's no question. Teachers need to have assessments that are closely aligned to the standards they're supposed to be working on in their yeah. classroom, and we got to make sure that happens. And can I say that there was enough involvement in the past? I don't know. But when I talk to people across the state, they've indicated to me that they're, they're, we need to have more involvement from those practitioners, and that's my goal. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't know what happened, how this all kind of fell apart. I think when the link was made between this testing regimen and teacher evaluations, that's when large questions about credibility and confidence in the testing, in the curriculum, in the standards, it all started to deteriorate at that point in time. I hope that can somehow remain on the table that we have some link between student performance and teacher performance, but maybe we were going in the wrong direction too far too fast. Well, I think one of the things that I've, uh, I've heard as I've been around the state is that um, that whole, the, almost the speed within which we've moved things that all of these are so interconnected right. that I think that was the rationale for moving pretty quickly on all of them. But that I, I believe that what I'm hearing is it has overwhelmed. And we have over 700 school districts, as you're aware. So you have districts that are at various levels of, of that implementation of the supports for teachers to help make the shift to the new standards. And moving to the new standards is really critical to be looking at assessments that match the new standards. So it has created that kind of angst and stress and, um, and I, I think it's my job to work to try to, to de-stress as much as I can. Teachers need to go into that classroom every day focused on what they can do to help every one of their students. Right. And these other things that put stress on them are difficult. Now, saying that, I still agree that we need to have a coupling of the students that were assigned to a teacher for the entire year just to be able to say, you did your job really well. Or, we, here's the growth areas that we think you can, you can focus on to get better. Right. So, it, it's, it's a balance, and I think in New York we've just put, in, put a lot of things on that plate too quickly. Well, I can tell you that representing school boards throughout the state, we've my board of directors and staff and I have talked a lot about this, of course, and we would like to get to a place where we could help those boards of education host conversations between the public and the school uh, officials, uh, teachers, 
and, and really be, provide a forum for people to talk about what they like, what they don't like, what they'd like to see changed, uh, where our current situation is, ultimately what are they hoping for, and see the connections between what's happening in a classroom and what happens in real life when this kid graduates. So we're working right now on some sort of a guide or some sort of an agenda to help boards of education host those kind of forums. And I'll, uh, I'll look for guidance from you as well. Well, we are putting together um, what I'm calling a toolbox. Um, I was asked by, by superintendents in, in the middle of the state, you know, mm -hmm. um, saying they didn't feel that they got that kind of support in the past That's and right. they want to have some resources that they can use to better communicate with clearly with parents, but with teachers and with the community at large, the business community. We have to all work to support the kids in this state. And that's really should be our goal, that should be our focus. And um, that support should be in uh, to, to support the school board members, the administrators and superintendents, and the teachers, all of them are important. I think we have to major, the major focus should be on our teachers because they're the ones that every day have students in front of them that we really want to move forward. And I know they do too. So we've got to really focus on that. But we'd be happy to share the kind of resources that we're going to be providing for our, our superintendents and our principals as leaders in the community to talk through this. We'll but it's, it's, what, it's what they want. Uh, we'll we do, we'll do likewise. Supports. We'll do likewise with you because I, we have to have buy-in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you don't have confidence in the system, uh, for whatever reasons, and it might be misaligned, it, it, it might be um, that you're working off some misinformation. I understand it, but if you uh, perception becomes reality, and if you if there's parents and citizens, media, teachers who have lost confidence, we got to somehow bring that back. Let's shift gears and talk a little bit about receivership. This mm -hmm. is something you inherited. There's 144 schools in this state that are either persistently struggling or struggling. Uh, 20 are persistently struggling across 17 school districts. And right now we have superintendents who have been assigned as receivers. And they have certain authorities to do certain things. There's some re resources available for those in persistently struggling schools. Tell me a little bit about that. Listen, every child in New York State deserves to have a great school providing for them and people there that are working hard to make that happen. Now, we have in these persistently struggling schools a long history of not being successful. And I'm not saying that the people there haven't worked really hard. They may have, but we've, we're not seeing the results with the kids and the problems are not getting better. We have to do something different. You can't keep doing the same thing. And so this first year, as you pointed out, superintendents have some ability to go in and to override things that have traditionally uh, not been available to them, those tools that they can use to make some substantive changes. The reality is we hope that they can do that. We hope that, that the legislation um, has provided those additional tools for them. Yeah, I, uh, I got to tell you, the people I represent are skeptical about this uh, receivership model. They have uh, beliefs that, quite honestly, socioeconomic conditions external to the school, uh, the places from where these kids come from, are really the, uh, the, the root cause of many of these problems that exist in the schools and the, the lack of performance. Listen, we have cases and models in the state of New York where people who, who in, are in schools have done the kind of connections with kids and their families, regardless of what's happened outside that school door, to be successful. Mm -hmm. So there are a whole lot of schools that have overcome this. We can't allow our students, no matter who they are, where they're coming from, we can't allow that to stop the efforts that we put in to change what is absolutely critical for them, and that's a good education. I cannot fix everything in society, nor can you, nor can your school boards, nor can the superintendents and the teachers. But we take students when they walk in that door, and we do everything we can to support them. And there are models within this state who have been very successful. So we've got to use those models, and if it's necessary, then as the commissioner, we will go in and take over the schools and try something different. You, as a receiver, my goal is to reach demonstrable progress. Right. Tell me what that means. Well, 
Um, so in a school, we have a lot of data about the school, but there are other things besides sco test scores that really show whether or not a school is moving forward. Um, things like connections to the community, um, things like um, a different climate within that school where students are um, given lots of opportunities. Um, a, a connection on really focusing one-on-one -on -one to how a particular student needs to be supported for success. Those are the kinds of things, if those structures are put in place, you might not see immediately the end results coming out in terms of supports or in terms of test scores. But what you will see is a shift in what was happening at the school from the time that they were identified to the time that we're looking at them at the end of that first year. This is going to vary school to school as to what demonstrable progress means. Absolutely. And I've done this, so okay. I know it doesn't happen overnight. But you do have indicators that things are, are looking different, are being different. You have um, surveys you can do from teachers, parents, and students. You can find out how things are going in a school and know whether you're on the right pathway. The uh, idea here, uh, you mentioned, you know, we'll come in and take over if need be. Where do you think these independent receivers or the people whom you would hire to be these receivers to take over, where would they come from? Well, I think they could come from different places. I think they could be organizations that might say, we can come in and take the school. Remember, you're taking the school with the same population that was at that school and assigned to that school. Yeah. It's not a selection process for kids. The kids are going to be there. It's taking those students and putting all the things around them uh, in a different way just supporting them in a different way, supporting them maybe in some of the same ways, but changing out some of the other things. I think that, that um, it could be, or as I said, organizations, it could be individuals, it could be people from across the country who have been successful in doing turnarounds with schools, a lot of schools. And think of the numbers of schools in New York State. Yeah. We have, yes, we have 117 on there. However, 144. 144 on there yeah. for both lists, right? 144. Yeah. But in the big picture, um, many schools have really taken on the challenges and made the changes, and they're not on that list. Okay. And so we need to really refocus this and see who can come in and help us do that. There are organizations, but there are also individuals who have worked many years in this in this field of education and have strategies that they know could be successful. So We've those, got to found, find those people. Yeah, we're going to need some help because I can tell you that there's a, there, I am concerned that people feel as if this receivership program is actually just a precursor to bringing in charter schools, closing schools, handing it over to a private organization, privatizing public education. And I'm hoping that's not the case. Well, that certainly is not the case from the Commissioner of Education in okay. New York State. Okay. Um, I'm very focused on support for kids in those schools. Yeah. And that's what I need to keep my eye on, and I think we all should. I think that's one of the things that in New York State, we are all dedicated to the education of children, and every child deserves to have an education like any child has in New York State. And that's a critical thing for us. So let me ask you, uh, while we're wrapping things up here, a couple people whom I'd like you to give some advice to. I'm a parent who is considering opting out of my child uh, from the 3-8 through eight testing. What would you say to me? I would say that we get information that helps us to plan in school districts and in schools and for specific teachers when we have students that sit and take those tests. I think that we have to look as a state, we have to look at the length of the test. That's one of the things I've heard across the state. Um, we have to make sure that it's aligned with the standards that are being taught to those students in their classroom by their teachers. But I would tell you that we have, all of us have taken assessments for many, many years and it does tell us things um, that we need to know about the pathways that we're going to put our students on for success. And I would urge people to look at that and see that the important thing is that ultimately we get information from those tests. I had a superintendent the other day that said to me, and she had a high, high opt-out rate, she said, I'm starting my school year without really the knowledge of the key things that I have to focus on for training and for support for my students. Because they don't have the because data. Because they don't have the data. I see. And so it's an important thing for us yeah. to make sure that we get the data. And, and we need to make sure that as we're doing this,
that we are improving things yeah. constantly. Well, I understand that you're going to have a, you know, there's going to, we're going to need to convince teachers, but I really do think parents are losing faith, and I want to make sure that part of what you're doing and part of what we're doing is connecting with those parents and showing the relevance of these tests towards what ultimately they're looking for. And they want these kids to graduate and be prepared for whatever awaits them in life. I want to be able to say, if they take this test, it will help inform that opportunity to develop that trajectory. That's exactly right. Okay. And, and the big issue really is, um, as we move this direction, we have not in the past done that kind of communication with right. parents. Yeah, that's right. They have been left off the page, and that's unacceptable. Yeah, that, that, that I think is your primary audience right now. The other one uh, I wanted to, uh, a primary audience for me are boards of education. And if you had some words that, uh, of advice, of wisdom that you would uh, impart to boards of education today, what might that be? I think that, that they need to become supportive if they're not. Many of them are extremely supportive of the, um, of the work that's being done in their schools and in their districts with administrators and leaders and teachers in the classroom. Yeah. And if you always look at the end result of this is what is best for students and make decisions and make your, use your vote to make those decisions for support for students, I think the school boards will ultimately be very focused on what needs to happen in their districts. They, too, need to understand why they are supporting this program. And some of them, I still think, are a little uncertain. They might have heard of a lot of other doubts expressed. Uh, they certainly hear from people within their community questioning, why would you support something of this nature? And we have to spend time talking to board members. You're an elected official. You took an oath of office. But I can't just say you have to uphold the law if they don't have confidence that this the Common Core Standards and the testing programs and what we're trying to do through a state policy is going to work for kids. So we really need to make that those connections. I'm, I'm working hard at it. I know you are too. Communication is the key to this. Um, people, parents have a right to review all the information and make a decision for their child. No. I understand that. No. Um, educators throughout this state, I hope understand that ultimately we need to move to what's best for kids and I do believe that knowing where students are so that we can help them to get to the next level or to continue on that pathway is critical and that's how we get information and so this is this is one of those times in um, and I think in our history where we have to go back and we have to say we haven't done everything right and let's review it let's change it and let's make sure that we're on the right path. But we have to do that together. So Absolutely. the communication is huge to make sure that everybody is with us in supporting kids in New York State. Well, those of us who operate at the local level uh, and believe in locally elected decision, ma uh, decision makers uh, need guidance. We need to be informed as to what we should be ultimately trying to achieve and why that mm -hmm. rationale needs to be solid. We need to understand it need to have the resources to make it happen. We need to know what those expectations are and that they're reasonable expectations. So I think if we work together on those sorts of things, uh, I think that we can be very successful. And I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for being with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our Newsmaker segment with Commissioner Ilya, a part of NISMA News, an ongoing service of the New York State School Boards Association. Thank you for being here. We'll look forward to seeing you again in the future.